Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our 63rd session of the Met AI Group Exchange. This week, we have Ajo Saporta from the Coron Institute at NYU with us to speak about her work on benchmarking saliency methods for checks and trade interpretation. Ajo is a PhD candidate in computer science at the Coron Institute at NYU, where she is advised by Professor Rajesh Ranganath and is the DeepMind scholar. Her research interests are at the intersection of AI and health. She co-hosts the AI Health podcast with Harvard's professor, Pranav Rajakoma. Previously, Ajo conducted research on Apple's health AI team, as well as in Dr. Andrew Ng's Stanford Machine Learning Group. She has a lot of industry, uh, industry experiences. She also holds an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business an MS in computer science from Stanford University, as well as a BA in comparative literature from your university. Thank you, Angel, for joining us today. Before we start, could you let us know how and when do you want to take in questions? Yeah, so please interrupt me. I, I'll take questions whenever um, I'll give the presentation, but please like you can just unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in the chat. and. Um, um, someone can just shout it out loud. I, I may not be able to see the chat when I'm presenting, but if somebody can just say it, say it out loud, but please feel free to interrupt me. I don't want this to be just me talking at you guys. Let's make it interactive. It's more fun and less nerve wracking that way for me. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, ask whenever, but I'll also, I'm, I'm probably only going to chat, talk for like an hour or a half hour. And then you guys, we can do Q and A afterward also. So whatever's easiest. Okay, sounds good. So let's try to uh, make this session as interactive as possible. Without further ado, let me hand it over to Adriel. Awesome. Okay, cool. Let me share my presentation. All right. Do you guys see all this here? Awesome. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you guys for coming to listen to this and listening in, whether you're doing it live or in the recording. Um, I'm gonna take you through some work that we did. We had it published uh, last month, which is really exciting. Before we dive in, I do want to just start by saying thank you to all of our amazing co-authors. Um, there's just no way we would have been able to do this without amazing collaborators in the Department of Radiology, um, both at Stanford and also at Vin Brain and Vin Mac International Hospital in, in Vietnam. Um, we started working on this at the, like, the right at the beginning of lockdown and COVID. And I feel like this project was like the thing that kept me going in that very dark early period. So it holds a very special place in my heart. Um, so, okay, cool. So a little background on the problem. Um, as I'm sure many of you already know, deep learning models are able to detect pathologies and chest x-rays with very high accuracy. And the potential benefits are huge. Um, you know, workflow prioritization, clinical decision support, large scale screening. Um, but many clinicians very understandably have been hesitant to adopt what they see as these sort of black box deep neural networks. And a lot of that has to do with lack of model interpretability. And again, that's pretty reasonable, right? Without being able to understand why a model is making the prediction that it is, there's a risk that it can perpetuate social biases, it could generalize poorly across different tasks, um, or even pick up on non-biological confounders in the image, which is what we're seeing this example that I have here. Um, so this image here is actually from another paper that you may have seen or heard about. The authors found that deep learning systems created to detect COVID-19 from chest x-rays were often focusing on areas of, um, of the image outside of the lung fields that contain these like hospital specific markers. And so basically chest x-rays that were positive for COVID-19 came from a different source or a different hospital than those that were negative for COVID-19. And so because of that, they had different hospital markers and the models might have been using those markers for prediction. Um, so it can be scary if we, you know, if we can't kind of pull back the curtain a little bit on, on what these models are doing. And so one type of interpretation strategy that's widely used in medical imaging is uh, the sali saliency methods. Um, and these, these methods produce heat maps, which is again, kind of what you're seeing here on the right. And they highlight the areas of the medical image that most influenced a model's prediction. So in the medical context, you can think of that as like helping to visualize whether or not a, a neural network is focusing on the same regions of a chest X-ray that maybe a radiologist would look at when they're when they're trying to make a diagnosis. And these saliency methods are really common in the medical context. Um, you know, they're used for everything from like detecting hypoglycemia from ECGs and 
visual impairment from you know retinal photographs or appendicitis from CAT scans. I mean, they're used all over. And one of the big questions that we had was sort of like, is that good? Are they do are they doing any are, are are they doing well? Like are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? And there have been studies that have been shown that have shown that in general saliency methods are not particularly robust and, and that they can be misleading or um, kind of give people a false sense of confidence in a model. But we want to see whether this was actually the case in the healthcare context and specifically with, with chest x-rays. And so ultimately, we'll, we'll dive into this more, but ultimately what we did is we performed a systematic evaluation of seven of the most commonly used saliency methods in medical imaging, including GradCam. Cool, okay, so let's start with the data set that we used. Um, we built off of Chexpert, um, which I'm sure some of you have heard about. It's a very large publicly available uh, data set of chest x-rays labeled for the presence of 14 observations. We focused on 10 of the 14 observations in, in Chexpert. Um, we didn't include fracture and plural other because they had very low prevalence on our test set, like I think fewer than 10, 10 examples. Um, pneumonia was not included because it's a clinical as opposed to a radiological diagnosis. Um, and then no finding was not included because it's hard to localize the absence of something. Um, cool. And like I said, we evaluated seven saliency methods. Um, D7 here, GradCam, GradCam++, Integrated Gradients, uh, EigenCam, Deep Lift, LRP, and Occlusion. And we ran experiments using three different CNN model architectures. Um, which were previously shown to do well in the Chexpert data set. So we used DenseNet 121, ResNet 152, and Inception V4. And we ran experiments sort of using all different combinations of these model architectures and, and these saliency methods and, and comparing them all to each other. And ultimately what we found is that GradCam with DenseNet 121 demonstrated better localization performance across the 10 pathologies that we looked at um, compared to the other combinations of saliency methods. Um, saliency methods and architectures. So in the rest of the work, when I say the saliency method pipeline, what I'm really referring to is DenseNet 121 plus GradCam, um, but we did try out all the different combinations um, and, and this was the best performing. Um, quick question here. Yeah. Um, your evaluation of which is better, was it more a qualitative one or was it, uh, did you have quantitative metrics to decide which is the best? We had quantitative metrics and we'll dive into that like right away, we're very, very soon because it's sort of in depth how we compared them. But that's a great question. And it was, it's a big part of our paper was sort of like how we decided to evaluate these saliency methods. Um, so very important and good question and we'll dive into more. One, one quick question for me. So when you say this model combination, so did you train this model on the chestnut data or do you train this model on other data and you're just evaluating the model on this chestnut data? We trained it on the Chexpert data um, and evaluated on Chexpert as well. So we had a- oh, okay test set, but importantly, we don't train the models, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but we don't train the models on the local, on the segmentations or on the localizations. We're just training it on the labels um, themselves, but they, it was, everything was done on Chexpert. Okay, because I, it would be nice to also see that, like how these webcams are like generalizable for the completely different data set because the models have some problems. So yeah, imagine that's... that the same things also holds for the science amounts. Totally, I totally agree. That's actually, that's a great point. Yeah. Cool. All right. So this figure is from our paper. Um, it gives just basically a high level view on, on how we went about evaluating the saliency methods. And then in the next few slides, then we'll, we'll go into sort of the, the metrics that we actually used. But um, so for each combination of saliency method and model architecture, we trained uh, and evaluated a, an ensemble of 30 CNNs. And I guess we'll start looking at the top row here. We passed each of the chest X-rays in our test set into, a, into that trained ensemble model. And then we got out image level predictions or probabilities for the 10 pathologies of interest. And so I, I can't see who asked the question, but that's what I meant when I, we, we train and, and we train the model just based on the labels. It has nothing to do with the localization. Then after the model has been trained and we get out these probabilities, we use these post hoc saliency methods to create saliency maps for each of the 10 classes that we're interested in. Um, so for each chest x-ray, we'll get 10 saliency maps out, one for each pathology, um, but we're really only interested in the ones that the chest x-ray is actually positive for. Um, so for example, on the top row here, this chest x-ray is only positive for airspace opacity, pleural effusion, and support devices. 
And so those are the only heat maps that we really care about. Um, and then we'll apply a threshold to them to, to produce this binary segmentation that you see on the right in, in purple. And now ultimately, right, like the point is to decide how good these saliency methods are. And so you know, in an ideal world, we'd have some sort of like ground truth to compare them to, right? We have other, you know, some radiologist, a human radiologist says like, this is a good saliency map or this is not a good saliency map. And so that's ultimately what we did is we went out and we got those segmentations. Um, and so in the middle in blue are our ground truth segmentations and we got them from a group of radiologists and we had them, you know, segment them all out. But the problem with this, or you know, the thing that first kind of came to mind for us is, that, of course, if you take two radiologists and you ask them to segment the same pathology on the same chest X-ray, there's actually fairly high variability in what those segmentations would look like. Um, so to understand what the human benchmark looked like, we collected a second set of expert segmentations from a separate group of radiologists entirely, which is what you see in green here um, on the bottom. And you'll see like a, kind of an example of this here. So in the middle, we have pleural effusion. And I don't know, can you guys see my arrow moving around? Is that, okay, cool. Um, so the ground truth radiologists felt in, in blue here, clearly feel that it's bilateral pleural effusion, meaning that there's those, the effusion is at the sort of the bottom of both sides of the, of the chest. But the benchmark radiologist felt like there's only effusion here on one side of, of the chest. Um, so you can see how there's, a, you know, there's, inter, there's uh, a lot of variability just even between uh, radiologists themselves. And so, we both wanted to look at how the saliency method segmentations compared to the ground truth segmentations, but also how the human benchmark compared to the ground truth. Um, cool. And I just wanted to say that, you know, so we, we actually, we released all of our code that went into all this work um, and also this, these data sets. So these, these uh, both sets of segmentations from both sets of radiologists, um, we publicly released them. We have, have a lot of really in-depth detail into uh, how to parse it and download it and understand it um, in, in that GitHub repo there. So I hope you guys check it out and play around with it a little bit. Um, and we also released actually, I don't know if anyone here has worked with the Chexpert data set at all, but we, we just released the Chexpert test set, which hadn't been released um, to date. So that's also something we, re we released with this. Okay, so now Nandita, I'm getting into what you're asking finally, <laughs> which is, um, so we've got these segmentations, great. Now, how do we actually compare them? And like, what do we, what does good look like? What does bad look like? So we use two different types of evaluation metrics to compare the segmentations. Um, the first one is IOU, which is a pretty standard method to, to evaluate segmentations. It stands for intersection over union and it measures the overlap of two sets of segmentations. Um, so, for example, we have two chest X-rays here. Uh, the one on the left is positive for pleural effusion. The one on the right is positive for enlarged cardiomediastinum. And you'll see that we that the chest X-ray on the left here, right? This, this the blue again is the ground truth segmentation. And you'll see that it, there's kind of a relatively small overlap between the purple and the blue here. And so, as a result, IOU is only 0 0.078. But on the right, there's a big overlap between the blue and the green. Um, so on the right, by the way, this is the human benchmark segmentation in green and the salience method segmentation here in purple. So this has a much larger overlap. And so the IOU is 0.682. Um, so IOU is sort of like what's generally used to compare segmentations. But I think like what has helped me explain this to people in the way that I think about it myself is that a lot of people would agree how to segment a stop sign or like a cat in sort of like traditional computer vision tasks. But radiologists use a certain amount of clinical discretion when defining the boundaries of a pathology on a chest X-ray. Um, not to mention that pathologies can be hard to distinguish if you don't have outside clinical context about that patient. Um, there can also be institutional and geographic differences in how radiologists are taught to recognize pathologies. And so you wouldn't expect two segmentations of a pathology to perfectly line up. And I actually think a good example of this is on the left, even though I know it's um, between the saliency method and the, and the ground truth, but I think it's a good example. We're like, yes, this little blue triangle is the, is the ground truth. This has a low overlap because, you know, the saliency method has sort of highlighted a big area around, <clears throat> around the triangle. But one could actually argue that the saliency method did like a pretty good job of 
of locating that pathology, right? Like it's still centered around that blue triangle. And yes, it's maybe a little bit too big, but it's like, I, I would say like it did a pretty good job. <laughs> you know, it didn't, it didn't totally blow it there. And it also I, depends on how you select the threshold, right? Because I think totally. this area selection is completely depends on how you select the threshold. So probably mm -hmm. if your thresholds are constrained, probably this area selection would be smaller. That is totally true. So we, so we determined, just so you know, in, in case you're interested, we, um, we determine the threshold on a per pathology basis using Otsu's method, um, which basically iteratively, iteratively searches um, for a value that maximizes interclass pixel intensity variance. Um, we actually tried a few different um, thresholding techniques and basically chose the one that performed best on the validation set on a per pathology MIOU basis. So we sort of like chose a threshold that gave both, that gave the, um, saliency method the best possible chance. So you selected the threshold for the class wise or you selected the threshold for like the whole task, like only one threshold? We said we did it on, on a per pathology basis. Per pathology, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So we were sort of like giving the saliency method its best possible shot when we selected the threshold, but that's a great point that yes. That's good, yeah. Sorry, did somebody else say ask something? No. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, so, uh, so again, yeah, the thresholding makes a big difference. Um, but IOU is sort of feels almost like maybe too strict in some ways. And so what we did was we, we tried to address this by choosing a second evaluation metric that we use, which is called the pointing game. Um, it's much less commonly used, but the idea behind it is to sort of determine it sort of like highlights when the segmentations share the same diagnostic intention, even if the exact bounds of the of the segmentation aren't perfectly aligned. Um, so for the pointing game, how it works is you take the pixel with the largest value from each saliency map, and then you determine whether or not that single pixel fell within the bounds of the ground truth segmentation. Um, so here on the left, we have the purple dot from which is the, the most intense pixel according to the saliency map. Um, it's within the blue uh, ground truth segmentation, so that would be considered a hit. And then on the right, you see that the green dot here is outside of this blue segmentation, and so that would be considered a miss. Of course, our benchmark radiologist didn't like assign a pixel value or a value to every single pixel in their segmentation. And so to sort of get around that, what we did is we had them actually, we, we asked them to find the single point on the chest X-ray um, that sort of that most identified, we called it the most representative point for that pathology on the chest X-ray. Um, so we had them do that in addition to actually drawing out the segmentations. And admittedly, there's a good amount of subjectivity there. Um, you know, like which point in the chest X-ray is most rep most representative depends on the pathology at hand. Um, so we did give some guidelines, like um, the most representative point for cardiomegaly would always be the center of the heart. Um, so we 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 gave some guidance there, but but for the most part, we, we let the radiologist kind of go with, the, go with their gut. But the idea is that it would always be inside of whatever segmentation they drew. Quick question actually, yeah. uh, before we go on to the next topic. So, um, so you had two radiologists, so they'll mark their most specific point in, in them. And then when you get the, the, the the purple point from your saliency method, are you comparing against, um, like if it's a match between either of the points suggested by the radiologist or was there a good level of? Um... That's a good question. So you'll see that for the ground truth segmentations here, we actually didn't have the ground truth radiologist do a point. For them, mm -hmm. it was just like, this is the ground truth uh, segmentation. Mm -hmm. and so when we compared the saliency method to the ground truth, the question was, does that purple dot fall somewhere inside of the blue? And then when we compared the human benchmark to the ground truth, it was, does the green dot fall within the blue segmentation? So Got we're it. never comparing dots to other dots. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I was just going to say that there might be a lot of variability there. So it makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. So here are the, the first bucket of results that we have. Um, in this graph, I know this is a lot, so I'm gonna, I'll walk through it slowly, but we're basically, we're comparing the saliency method pipeline, which is in purple, um, with the human benchmark, which is in green. And this is the graph for um, MIOU, which is just mean IOU. So um, it's just the mean IOU of, of all the test set images for that pathology. 
And I'll show you in a moment the point and gain um, result as well. But I would say the, the biggest takeaway from this is just that the saliency method pipeline demonstrated significantly worse localization performance on the test set when compared with the human benchmark, whether or not we were using MIOU or hit rate um, as the evaluation metric. And this was regardless of model AUROC, classification AUROC. So I've, I've included the AUROC down here on the bottom here so you have a sense of how well uh, the model was actually performing. So for five of the 10 pathologies, which are the five over here, the saliency method pipeline had a significantly lower MIOU than the human benchmark. Um, so for example, support devices um, had one of the highest AUROC scores of the 10 pathologies, but it had some of the worst saliency method localization performance when using MIOU. Um, it's, so it's worth pointing out that the saliency method did uh, significantly outperformed the human benchmark on two pathologies, atelectasis and, and consolidation. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out was that you'll notice that the, the human benchmark segmentations have pretty low overlap with the ground truth segmentations, right? Like the highest MIOU is uh, 0.72, I think, for, uh, for cardiomegaly over here. And so um, I think that sort of like hammers home the point that while IOU is a common metric for evaluating segmentations, there are sort of inherent limitations um, to using it for, for medical imaging, or at least you have to kind of keep that in mind. And this is the same graph, but for um, hit rate. And so um, this is using pointing gain. So basically what we call hit rate is just the percentage of all segmentations that were hits as opposed to misses. Um, and again, it's not looking too good for saliency methods here. <laughs> so on average, um, the hit rate saliency method performance was about 29% worse than the human benchmark. And it didn't significantly outperform the human benchmark on any of the 10 pathologies. Um, and, and you'll notice that the localization performance of the human benchmark is also like generally higher when using hit rate as opposed to MIOU, since again, it's a, it's a little bit of a less strict method. Um, so the hit rate was above 0.9 for, for the pathologies, um, pneumothorax, cardiomegaly, enlarged cardiomediastinum, and support devices. Um, and those so so, sorry to stop you here. So uh, this is kind of interesting that when you see that the performance is actually good for the larger finding, but when you go to the smaller finding like lung lesion, actually the performance gets worse. I love that you noticed that. That's amazing. <laughs> we, oh, I that. No, that's great. That's, that's okay. like really exactly what we go on to show. Ah, okay. Okay. Go on. No, but okay. that's a great thing to have noticed. And that's exactly what we saw too. We were like, that's interesting. Like that, what, what's, what's happening there? But yes, that's exactly right. In general, we found that the saliency methods did better when, when the pathologies were bigger and larger in size compared to the size of the, the chest X-ray image um, than once small. But it's kind of interesting that uh, AUC actually doesn't show that that thing. The AUC performance is, for the lung lesion is still pretty high compared yeah. to like other larger um, thing, like for example, cardiomedicine, right? Which is a really, really large finding, but you know, saliency performance is good, but the AUC is really bad. I love that you're like pointing all this out because that's exactly that's that, like you're following along with exactly what our thinking was like that's, that's what we noticed and so we went on and said okay like what pathologies what characteristics of the pathologies led the saliency methods to do better or worse and then also is there some sort of correlation between model confidence and and localization performance because it doesn't seem like AUROC is sort of clearly explaining that um, to us so okay okay totally Love that. <laughs> and I guess it's also worth noting that, and this you know, has a lot to do with, with the size as well, that the four pathologies that it's doing really well on are, are they tend to be bigger, but also there are pathologies that there tends to be little disagreement between radiologists about where they are, right? Like cardiomegaly is gonna be the heart and radiologists just know that. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not gonna be, there's not gonna be as much variability there. Um, I had two questions on this, and maybe actually Iman can also join uh, chip in. But um, from my understanding, I thought cardiomegaly is, is based on the size of the heart, like um, like whether it's a, an enlarged heart or not. So I feel like choosing the center of the heart, like even if you have a larger heart or the smaller heart, might give you the same result. So I'm I'm kind of curious how whether, whether you guys thought about it. And the second question was um, like. This, this discussion on like the large, the, the size of the uh, pathology that you're talking about uh, being bigger, meaning uh, like this finding that, okay, bigger pathologies maybe are doing better. 
is interesting, but I thought support devices are usually on the smaller end of the spectrum. And so, but they seem to be really doing well. So, um, um, okay, so let's, let's talk about, well, I'll, we'll talk about quickly the support devices thing. So, cause we'll, let's talk more about that in a little bit when we get to that point. But I think with support devices that they're just like, they're very, the human, the like radiologists know a support device when they see it. It's like a tube or it's a wire. It's like something very obvious. And I think the reason why the saliency method tends to do pretty poorly on support devices, both under MIOU and hit rate is that they're always like weirdly shaped. You know, they tend to be like long and complicated. They're not sort of like this nice rectangular, simple shape. And, but we'll, but we can talk more about that. I think, I think here I have to support the model because the support device is, I personally believe that the, the class level is not accurate because they call everything support devices, you know? And it is not fair, right? Like, this, as, you, as you also mentioned, right? Like, like for example, if you have the ECG support device, they are really like, like look like string. If you have the heart support device, they look like a box. So it's not really fair to call everything support device. Like, it's also confusing for the model. Like, what, what we can classify as support device, you know? That's interesting, actually. I didn't think about that. I yeah, love and one. and for example, like lung lesion or the cardiomegaly, uh, as you as we know that there is a perfectly a proper shape and the size and the location, but support device can be anywhere, any shape, any location. So yeah. it's not really fair to the model, right? And, I uh, really like that point of view, actually. That's no, that's and, a great, great point. Yeah, and even if the model is doing great, because um, I would imagine that the model should not do that great for the support device, because you understand, like we particularly. That's why I was interested if you run this experiment on the mimic data set, because mimic is primarily like ICU patient, hmm. and they have a lot of wires and everything hanging from them. So most of the time, the model to chain on just for data identify those as support device, and you cannot like blend them, right? Because they look like support device. Totally. No, that's a really interesting point. I also, because another thing that, and I say this a little bit later on, but one of the things that I wish that we could have done, or, and I hope that other people do going forward, is like how the saliency method localization performance um, better or worsen given how consistently located something is, right? So you're talking about right. like, the device is always moving around. It's not always in the same place. Is that, does that affect the way of, you know? That's a very good point, yeah. Um, I love this. Yeah, that's a great, I, I, and honestly, and I should say like, I have no medical background. So like a lot of me doing this work was sort of having to work with radiologists and learn all of this on the fly. So I, like, I don't know, I can't see who's talking from my presentation mode, but I like, I like really welcome all this feedback. Cause even for me, I'm like, I, I guess I know a few support devices, but I don't really know, you know, all the many different types that there could be. So it was great. And then, sorry, Nadita, I think you had another question about and now it's, it's slipping from my mind. Something about cardiomegaly. Oh, and and like whether there was difference in, in large versus smaller and whether it would always be the same, the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I think the way that we, we so for pointing game, we had the radiologist identify the center, but you're right. I guess is your question, you know, whether or not it'd be harder or easier for the saliency method, given how enlarged the heart was? Well, I guess it's, it, like I, I'm not saying it's harder for saliency versus humans or anything, but I'm I'm just thinking, um, okay, the cardiomegaly is is observed when the heart is enlarged, and mm -hmm. so, but when you're using the the hit rate, essentially the center is going to like possibly be the same irrespective of whether the larger. Yeah. So is there something that maybe there is some other differences that are going on, but I'm not captured if you just look at the center. In that case. Yeah, I think that I think that raises a, a good point, which is just that I think all of these evaluation, or at least sorry, these two evaluation metrics have pros and cons. Not, mm -hmm. I would say neither one of them is perfect, and neither one of them captures everything. And I think that's a great example of something that hit rate misses entirely. Right, you sort of reduce the problem to just one single point, and you're missing out on like how enlarged the heart is and what's happening. So I think it's a great point. I think I think Nandita that when they measure the cardiomegaly, they doesn't really look at like the size of the heart. What they look at like how much heart actually enter into the lung, you know? Oh, I see. Particularly so for chest x -ray. So it's just like a small strip. Because imagine like even if you have a cardiomegaly, you, your full heart is not in in the lung, right? You just see a little bit portion of the heart inside the lung. Like it will seem like it's overlaid on the lung. I, see, so I, I see. think I think. I don't know for, for them, like how they annotated the cardiomegaly for the human performance, but I would imagine that the radiologists only annotate the enlarged region, not the full heart, you know? 
Okay, that makes sense actually. So we did enlarge only the then the location definitely would change, I guess. I wish I had an example of one that we could look at together. I think they were segmenting the whole heart though. Um, okay. Okay, yeah, but- because I would I would imagine like they would particularly segment this region, you know, which is like inside the lung. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm because pretty this- sure they're they were segmenting the whole heart, but that's an whole interesting. Heart? Uh, okay. Yeah. Because I would imagine that, that is not cardiomegaly, right? Like, because you have, uh, of course, every human being has heart, but it's not cardiomegaly. Cardiomegaly is how much heart is enlarged, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, there's, so in our appendix, we do have the instructions that we gave. Ah, okay. I'll okay. just, we can, we can go look at those all together at some point. Like okay. when we run through with the presentation and get a sense of exactly what was, what was given. And, and we gave examples as well. Okay. Um, I love this discussion. This is great. <laughs> Okay. Oh, do I have control? Oh, there you go. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so we have more results, but before we get there, I want to take a, a brief interlude to sort of just talk through like what this means, what the implications of this are, because I think that an all too easy takeaway from our paper that people often have is, oh, okay, so like saliency methods are bad. But I actually think it's more nuanced than that. And, and we explain why in the paper, um, and I think it's important to sort of hammer home here um, and ask questions as I go through this, because I know that this is a little bit convoluted, but um, so saliency methods are a form of post hoc interpretability. And what I mean by that is that the models that are, that we use for prediction are never trained or they're never exposed to bounding box annotations or, or pixel level segmentations during training, um, which makes them really, really useful for medical imaging because, you know, in, in the medical context, getting, collecting these round truth segmentations can be a huge pain, it's time consuming, it's expensive. Um, but it also makes it really, really hard to know what the problem is with the model or with the saliency method. And so to illustrate this, I've got this sort of like toy example here. Um, but imagine that you had two kinds of models um, and two kinds of saliency methods. You have a model, a bad model, which we're gonna call MBAD, that has perfect AUROC for some image classification task, but that we know thanks to some Oracle does not localize well. Like it's the model is picking up on confounders in the image. And then we've got a good model called M good that has perfect AUROC, but that we know thanks to our Oracle that it does localize well. Like it's looking at exactly the right part of the X-ray that we, that we want it to look at. And then we've got a bad saliency method and a good saliency method. The bad saliency method does not reflect the model's attention is just like doing a bad job of telling us what the model is doing. And the good saliency method does properly reflect what the model's attention, where the model is directing its attention. And like, let's say that we have the exact same situation that we found in our paper. We um, classify an image, we apply a saliency method post hoc, we do our evaluation, and we find that there's very poor localization performance, whether it's measured by MIOU or hit rate. There are three possible pipelines that could lead to the scenario. We could have our bad model and our good saliency method, a good model and a bad saliency method or a bad model and a bad saliency method. The first scenario where we have a bad model and a good saliency method is like, that's like the scenario that saliency methods were created for, right? Like it's like we have this, we have this uh, working saliency method that properly alerts us when we have a model that's picking up on confounders. Like that's like, that was like the ideal intention of saliency methods. The second scenario is like our nightmare scenario. That's when we have a good model that's actually like appropriately directing its attention, but we're rejecting it on the basis of some poorly localizing saliency method. We have some saliency method that's just doing a bad job of telling us what the model is doing. And so we're like, oh, that model must be bad because the saliency method is telling us it's bad, but actually the model was good. It was just the saliency method that was bad. And then of course, scenario three is just bad all around. And the important point here is that because all three scenarios result in poor localization performance, it's difficult if not impossible to know whether poor localization performance is actually attributable to the model or to the saliency method or to both. And so we don't say in our paper that like saliency methods are bad or that models are bad. What we're saying is something's not working here. (laughs) Something in this pipeline is not working. And until we figure it out, we probably shouldn't be relying on saliency methods to evaluate model localization or, or to evaluate individual model decisions that, a, that, a, that a, a model is making or individual predictions that a model is making. But 
I like really, really want someone to work on this. Like I would love for future work to look into this more and try to see if there's like a way that we can figure out how to disentangle localization performance attribution here. Um, so anyway, I'll pause here in case you have questions about this, but like this feels like something that is easily overlooked because like the headline grabbing exciting thing is like saliency methods are bad. Don't use saliency methods. But like, I think it's an important point to hammer home before we move on to the rest of our results. Um, I think this is a great um, like way of thinking about like the end result is bad, but how can we like ensure it's coming from the model being bad and not from, you know, just a, a random saliency method being bad. Um, I was wondering if, if um, you can have like a test model, which is like trained on perfect human segmentations, like it's learned to segment. So mm -hmm. it, so by definition, if it's doing well on those segmentation tasks, it needs to know how to localize properly. And so if you could benchmark the saliency methods on that model, and you can kind of see whether your saliency method is, is good for a good model or bad for a good model. Just, just trying to like see whether, you know, you, you can, you can get a, I know my model is good. Can I evaluate whether my saliency mo uh, method is good or not? That's interesting. So you're saying basically train a model on the actual segmentations and then evaluate them afterward, comparing it to the model that was not trained on, on it. That's a good, I, I'd have to like think about it a little bit more, but I think that's, a, that's an interesting idea, actually. Um, it's not obvious to me now, like why that wouldn't, why that wouldn't work. I like that idea. <laughs> Let's think more about that actually, because I think that, I think that's an interesting point. I, I like that. Be happy to chat about that as well. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, I just want to clarify one thing. Um, hi. Uh, the analysis which is shown earlier, the statistical analysis, is it just based on the grad cam or is it for other uh, uh, saliency maps as well, the similar things. This is just grad cam that we're showing here, but we did do, we did evaluate this with other saliency methods as well. And that's in our, the appendix of our paper. And, okay. Uh, we're just showing grad cam because it was the best performance of all of them. And so okay. we ultimately were sort of giving saliency methods the best possible chance. Um, so okay. this graph is just grad cam. And another just quick question that, uh, is there some reason why you choose for, uh, like uh, went for IOU metric for segment evaluation? IO, why we chose IOU? Yes. So we chose IOU because that's sort of a common segmentation, a common metric that's used to compare segmentations. We also did hit rate as well of pointing game. So we, so we actually went with two different uh, evaluation metrics. Um, and the, our idea was that they capture different things. They're, they're sort of capturing uh, okay. different summaries that we care about. Like I was wondering, there is another like kind of popular metric, which is size coefficient, which is also used in this aspect. So I was then thinking whether to choose, okay. Yeah, like we, we didn't, we went with these two, but that's, okay. that's a great point. And I, and I think like one of the things I would love to see people do in the future is sort of think about which evaluation metrics make the most sense for different pathologies or different contexts, because I do think that there's, it's not like there's one metric that's the best. I think they all capture important things that we would care about. So I think that's a, it's a great idea. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, so now we're finally getting to what you guys brought up earlier, which is sort of like, oh, weird. Why is, why are salience methods doing big, better on these bigger pathologies and not the smaller ones and what's happening here? And so that was sort of our next question was like, what, why, when do saliency methods perform better or worse? Does that have to do with the pathology itself? Does it have to do with model confidence or how the model performs? Um, so the first thing we did was we conducted a statistical analysis using four different pathological characteristics. Um, the first one was number of instances. So some segmentations have like sort of like one big instance here. Oh, by the way, this is cardiomegaly. So this is our answer to our question. Um, on like yeah, so you see like they didn't annotate the full hat. So the heart would be all like all the way. As all, well. all, yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But it's still, this is not, yeah, they can call it cardiomegaly, but ideally like this is still inside the heart, right? So mm -hmm. I don't know what was the annotation protocol, but it's kind of, yeah. Cool. 
Okay, so that so yeah, so this is an example of one instance. Um, here at electasis, we've got two. Um, the second characteristic that we cared about was size. So you see here, like obviously this is really big and large cardiomediastinum, but then we've got a small little lung lesion right here. Um, and then the last two pathological characteristics is sort of what we were talking about before with support devices. It was sort of trying to capture the complexity of a pathology shape. Um, and I, I guess, although it sounds like you guys might know better than I do, but what radiologists maybe often describe as focal or diffuse. Um, and so for both characteristics, we have two characteristics here, elongation and e-rectangularity. Um, and so for both, we would fit, we fit a rectangle of minimum area enclosing the binary mask. That, those are the yellow boxes that you see. Um, and then elongation is just max length over min length. Um, and then rectangularity is the area of the segmentation over the area of the enclosing rectangle. And then e-rectangularity is just one minus that ratio. And so you'll see like the support devices, and this was brought up earlier, but like when they are sort of wires or tubes or, you know, long things that they, they sort of have high elongation. Um, and then an example of pleural effusion can sometimes take that like V shape at the bottom of a lung. And so that sometimes we would find that pleural effusion would have um, sort of this like very highly e-rectangular shape, this sort of like complex shape. So we've sort of in our minds, we're like, okay, this is just pathology complexity, like shape complexity, essentially. Um, and so then for each metric, so for MIOU and for hit rate um, or IOU and, and hit miss, we ran a series of linear regressions um, one using, or each using one of the four characteristics, so one of the four geometric features as a single independent variable. And the idea was to understand the relationship between the pathology feature and the localization performance. So the regression coefficient was sort of interpreted as the effect of that feature on localization performance using that evaluation metric. And there were sort of like two main takeaways here. Um, the first was that the size, as the size of the pathology increased, the saliency method localization performance improved. And then the second was that as elongation and e-rectangularity increased, the saliency method localization performance worsened. And these results were consistent across both IOU and hit miss evaluation metrics. Like no matter what, saliency method performance did worse when pathologies were smaller and when they were more complex. Cool. And then we did the same, we did again, another series of regressions to see how model performance when predicting the presence of a pathology affected the saliency methods ability to localize that pathology. Um, so again, like more regressions, uh, was there any correlation? The question was, is there any correlation between the model's confidence in its prediction and the saliency method localization performance? Um, so we ran a regression for each pathology using the model's probability output for the pathology as a single independent variable, and then using the saliency method IOU as a dependent variable. We did this for hit rate as well, but we're I'm just focusing on IOU here. Um, and then for the last row in the table here, we just ran another same setup, uh, as another simple regression, but just this time combining all 10 pathologies all together. And we report the linear regression coefficient, but also the Spearman correlation coefficients to capture any potential nonlinearity, uh, any nonlinear associations. And we found that for all pathologies, the model confidence was positively correlated with the saliency method localization performance. Um, the p-values for all the coefficients were below 0 0.001, except for pneumothorax and lung lesion, which were the two pathologies for which we had the, the fewest positive examples. Cool. All right, so takeaways. Um, we showed that the, you know, the, the saliency method pipeline is consistently worse than expert radiologists, regardless of model classification AUROC. And that's concerning in a clinical setting because you know, if, if saliency maps are inaccurately highlighting a pathology, it could easily cause a clinician to lose trust in a model's predictive ability, even if the model output prediction is correct. And like that's the, that's the good model plus bad saliency method nightmare scenario that we talked about earlier. Um, and, and you guys might, uh, people in this, in this room might know this better than I do, but many of the large chest x-ray vendors of my understanding is that they use a lot of these localization methods to provide pathology visualizations in their CAD products. Um, and like saliency maps are, are used for clinical decision support, quality improvement and, and quality assurance. Um, they're used for data set annotation. Um, but our findings are kind of showing that something's going off, something's wrong here. And, and they're just not reliable enough yet to validate individual clinical decisions that are made by a model. 
We also show that saliency, met, uh, saliency method pipeline localization is worse when a pathology is smaller in size and less and, and more complex, um, which would suggest that maybe deep learning explainability at the clinical interface is maybe less reliable and less useful when used for pathologies with those characteristics. Uh, we showed that model assurance is positively correlated with saliency method localization performance. So maybe saliency methods are safer to use as a decision aid to clinicians when the model has made a positive prediction of high confidence. And then finally, we released the public, um, we publicly released this development data set, um, which we're calling Check, Checks Localize, of 234 images with 643 expert segmentations. Um, again, like, please reach out to me if you have questions about it. Like that was where we really, we like want people to use it and I hope that it's, it's helpful. Um, I do want to just point out some future work because I just like, I, there's so much to do here still. And you guys had such great ideas like just throughout this conversation already. Um, I think that deep learning explainability is so important for medical imaging. I think it's one of the big bottlenecks that we're facing in terms of being able to really deploy these models into clinical workflows. Um, so I'm super excited to see what people do in this space. Um, again, like a big reason we released this data set is that we're hoping people will use it to develop either more saliency methods, but maybe just other types of explainability techniques for medical imaging. Um, you know, you, you would suggest this on for like, you know, testing out uh, uh, model attribution, but, you know, maybe we move away from post hoc interpretability and actually develop models that directly use these ground truth segmentations during training. Um, so there's still a lot of room to grow here. Uh, we discussed this earlier. Uh, localization performance attribution, you know, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to know whether core localization is attributable to the model or the saliency method. And so would love to see somebody work on trying to disentangle that. Um, maybe there's a confounding effect of model calibration on the evaluation of saliency methods. I think that's something that people can look into more. We didn't have a chance to look into um, as much as we would like to have. Um, our data set only had 11 chest x-rays with pneumothorax and 50 with lung lesion. And so it would be interesting to see what the impact of pathology prevalence in the training data is on saliency method localization performance. Like how much does the um, model need to actually see? Um, we talked about this also, but some pathologies like uh, effusions and cardiomegaly are like always in, in the same place in, in a frontal view chest x-ray, um, but others like lesions and opacities can occur in different locations. And so it'd be interesting to see sort of how a pathology's location, but also the consistency of that location would affect um, saliency method localization performance. And then finally, you know, we focused on pathologies that are present in the, in the chest x-ray, but the lack of a given finding can sometimes inform clinical diagnoses. So, um, you know, like the lack of normal lung tissue pattern around the edges of the thoracic cage might be used to detect pneum pneumothorax. And so it'd be interesting to see sort of or explore sort of these counterfactual visual explanations that are sort of similar to the counterfactual diagnostic process of a radiologist and whether that can help at all with this with this localization. Okay, so that's all I have, but let's keep chatting because I really love this and you guys all have really great ideas and <laughs> um, love to hear any more questions that you guys have. I can, I can leave the slides up for a little bit in case you guys wanna reference them, but I also would love to see your faces and see who's talking, so. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess before we move on to questions, so let's thank Abriel for the wonderful talk with a round of virtual applause. Um, I think it was a great, um, like, I think benchmarking saliency is, is definitely much required at this point. And then showing it on uh, chest x-rays is, is definitely really valuable for clinical uh, usage. So um, yeah, I guess we already have one manual uh, who wants to ask a question. So go ahead, one manual. Hi, thanks for your great presentation. I had a question um, on what your thoughts are on evaluating predictive models as opposed to models that are um, classifying. Uh, uh, diseases present in the image versus absent. So things that actually look at a future outcome, for example. So Juan Manuel, I think your audio is breaking up a little. So if I could just summarize your question. So one was like thoughts on classification versus presence or absence um, type model. No, I think I think he meant like um, prediction, you know, like future prediction, future event prediction or something like that. Oh, I see. Okay, gotcha. Future event prediction. 
So imagine like if you if I give you a chest X-ray today, can you predict that what is my risk of having a lung lesion in two Got years? It. Right. But, but for lo- meaning and localized use methods in that context? No. So it's a silence method. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, do you see still the model is focusing on some particular region or because there is no lung lesion yet, right? Right. But there right, could right. be some feature that is uh, kind of like characterizing the future lung lesion. That's really, really interesting. I like that. That sounds like something I would really love to see you work on because <laughs> that sounds really, really cool. Yeah, I, we, we hadn't thought about that, but I think that would be fascinating to sort of, to, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I but that. I would imagine that in that case, you will never get a ground truth, you know? Because none of the radiologists can out that predictive characteristics for you. Yes, that's right. It, it would be It would be a different type of experimental setup, right? It would just right. be we'd have to, we'd have to get long-term, relatively long-term data, right? Like it, it, ideally we'd have some patients who- With lung lesion, yeah. To, in, then we can go back and map those exactly. locations. Yeah. That's exactly right. And then you're right that there wouldn't be a ground truth except that you would have the later chest X-ray could be okay. a form of ground truth where you're like, okay, this is where we know that the lesion will develop. Did we see anything in that area beforehand? But that's a great, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting point. It's, and I'd almost be curious if the model picked up on some other indicator that was like outside of where the, somewhere totally different than where the lung lesion is just to see if there was anything indicative there. Like it, it almost feels like, yeah, I don't know. I think that's actually really, I think it's, I think it's a great idea. It'd be interesting to see if we could do that. Um, and then just use the later ground truth segmentations as sort of like a, a ground truth sort of. Awesome. Did that answer your question, Juan Manuel, or do you want to have any like, follow-up discussion as well? Yeah, I think that answered my question and sorry uh, for my connectivity. Um, I, I, I think about this a lot because I've worked on uh, predicting future disease from images and uh, I face the question of how do I know if my model's looking at the right things and we don't even know what the right things to look at potentially. Totally. We would also want to hear more about what you're working on. That sounds really cool and really interesting. I should have put my email down here, but by the way, my email is just adriel at nyu.edu. So like, please email me after this. I would love to like chat about what everyone's working on and hear more about that. Cause that sounds great. Awesome. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, I actually had one more question, Adriel. So um, I know that you said GradCam basically performed better than all the other um, attribution methods. Um, do you have a sense of like how much better? Like were they were they just like around the ballpark? Maybe like they might work for some pathologies. Like what's the scale of? Uh, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't like GradCam was unbelievably better. It was sort of ballparkish, honestly. And it was it was it was a pretty close call, if I remember correctly. We have we have the results in our appendix, but um, it, w- it was definitely like for some pathologies, not all, you know, other saliency methods did better for other pathologies. Um, and we just felt like GradCam was best mar- on the margin. It was better across both evaluation metrics, but it, it wasn't, I mean, I think some saliency methods definitely perform much worse, <laughs> but there were definitely like other contenders up there. So it wasn't like gra- it was, you know, Cam was far and away the best by any by any means. Um, so another area of interesting future work would be like seeing if certain saliency methods are better for specific types of pathologies versus others, um, because we def it definitely there are definitely some saliency methods where that were better on certain pathologies than Gradcam was for sure. Thank you. And, and yeah, yeah, I would be sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say quickly that, and same goes for even model architecture. I mean, I think DenseNet was like was pretty consistently more so than grad cam was pretty consistently better, but there were occasionally ResNet also did, uh, you know, well as well. Um, but I'm sorry, go ahead. So did you guys, can you go back to the bar plot that you were showing between radiologist and um, uh, model? Yeah, so uh, did you guys tie, did also this for between the two radiologists? The, so that's what the in green that we have here. No, but that is like only one radiologist, right? Do you also try to compare the same annotation? Like imagine like 10 images annotated by the same, like two different radiologists and you do the be- this kind of like analysis on the performance of two radiologists, like inter-annotator agreement more or less. I see. 
Got it. So you're saying basically like get two sets of ground truths essentially. Yes, to yes. To both of them. Um, that's fair. We didn't do that um, just because asking radiologists to say- yeah, I understand <laughs> because at least even if it is like 10 or 15, but at least just to understand that if how much variation they have, because I would imagine if you just look at the IOU score between the cardiomegaly, cardiomerestium, between model and radiologist, you would see the same probably similar performance also between the radiologists. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what the human benchmark was trying to capture, though, right? Was to get a sense okay. of what that variability tends to look like. Okay. Um, that was that was the but, point of having it. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, human benchmark in terms of like the other metrics is different versus IOU is different, right? IOU is, you are directly comparing the overlap. So I would imagine that even if the overlap would be sometimes very minimal, because if everybody sees the findings differently, you know. Sorry, so you're saying you're uh, sorry. What was different than the overlap? Yeah, for example, in pneumothorax, right? Yeah. If you ask like a radiology residents, probably you should annotate pneumothorax, they would annotate the, the full region. Hmm. But if you ask a professional radiologist, like many years of experience, ask, like asking to annotate the pneumothorax, they will just annotate probably a smaller region. You know. Got it. But so I owe you. And why doesn't this the, the human benchmark metric here capture that in your mind? Because it's just like one bar, right? I would like to see the same two bars parallel between like multiple radiologists, you know, two or three or whatever, how many radiologists you have. Yeah, that's fair. I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure there's work by the way out there that we can- Yeah, we know that. that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, like, yeah. Has, has like looked into the into what the variability would be, but but that's that's totally fair. Yeah, right. we, didn't, we didn't get a chance to do that though, unfortunately. Adriel, wouldn't the error bars on the green plot kind of do the same? Isn't... I think it's a mean and then the error bar is the variation of yeah. all the annotations in, in there. Yeah. It's not the variation of between radiologists, the variation between the test sets. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I think we have one more um, question also. Cool. Siddhartha, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Or I can read it out for him. Um, so. For smaller pathologies, does, uh, do methods which have higher pixel variability, like looking at input gradients, perform better than grad camps, which seem to interpolate or upsample to match the input size? Great question. And I think this goes back to what we were just talking about earlier. The, the answer is I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I certainly don't remember, and it's not what we've looked at. But I think that's a great place to, to be digging into more. I, I, I'm sure that you're right, that I'm, I bet that there are certain of these saliency methods that tend to do better on pathologies with certain characteristics than others. Um, and I love that avenue for future work. I like, I think one of my favorite things about just talk the last hour, by the way, has just been like, you guys are asking all these questions and I'm like, yeah, like we should look into that. That's a great idea. And so that's a, that's a fabulous idea. And um, we didn't look into it, but that makes a lot of sense because I do think that that was a big, I think a big problem with grad cam is that we just have, it's, pretty low resolution with these like small maps that then have to be upsampled to the size of the chest x-ray image. And so you lose a lot of granularity there, which is I think a big reason why they tend to perform worse on complex and, and small pathologies. Awesome, yeah. I guess one additional thought for future work probably is um, um, to compare if you had different types of training. So in, for instance, instead of supervised training, if you do self-supervised training, are the yeah. models look better for saliency or does that inherently give some robustness? So that might be some cool things to explore as well. <laughs> awesome. So I guess this was a very um, interactive discussion. So thanks everyone for participating in Adriel's wonderful talk. Um, we will put up the YouTube uh, video up online uh, tonight. And so if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to Adriel or you can reach out to us also and then we can put you in touch with her. Um, yeah, but thanks everyone for participating and then see you all next week. Perfect. Thanks guys. I really appreciate it. And thanks for all the questions and chatting with me. Please. Thank you. Yeah.